Father, thank you for sending your son to become a man, to live a perfect life, to die a death of substitution, to die a death on a cross where, Lord, your son took the guilt that we, that took our guilt and paid for our sin by satisfying your wrath, your, your righteous wrath, your righteous anger, your righteous indignation, your righteous hatred of sin, and, and then died a, a real death, and then rose from the dead. And so now, because of the fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us, we look back and we see the life of the Son of God on earth, and we see the fulfillment of so many promises and so much of the prophecy of the Old Testament fulfilled in Christ. And we thank you. And we praise you. And that's really the, the only true meaning of Christmas is to consider that reality and to live in light of that reality. And Lord, it's our privilege every Lord's Day to come together as your church and to worship and as we have been worshiping throughout this service and as we continue to worship, I pray that you'd be glorified and honored. Help us as we turn our attention to your word. As we turn our attention back to the biography of your son, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. I pray that we would benefit from what we find. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you may take a seat and I wanna invite you to grab your Bibles and open up to Mark. Mark chapter 4. I am, I, I've got to confess, I'm just loving the gospel of Mark more and more. And um, I've studied the book of Mark for a long time. I, I, I preached it once about a decade, a little over a decade ago. And I came back to Mark 4 this week with fresh eyes and almost felt like I wondered if I'd ever read this book before, ever read this passage before. You ever have those experiences where you just, it just jumps off the page and you realize, man, this is just so profound and so rich. And so we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Mark 4, verses 1 through 20. And I already, I already, I've already tapped out, <laughs> I tapped out sometime around Thursday this week. I know I'm not going to cover all 20 verses uh, we're not going to do it all at once, so I apologize, but uh, we are going to see how far we get. We're, Lord willing, we'll get to verse, through verse 12, but I want to read the whole section because as you're probably familiar with these parables in Mark chapter 4, uh, he tells parables that are uh, kind of obscure, and then in verses 13 to 20, he explains the first parable. So I want to read all of verses 1 through 20, and it, it all goes together, but we won't have the time to finish all of it this morning. So follow along with me, chapter 4, verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, To you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom, excuse me, the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing, 
they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown in rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom the seed was sown in good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30, 60, and a hundredfold. Because of uh, your familiarity with the parable of the sower, or better, the parable of the soils, uh, the, the, the punch of the parable might be lost on us who are overly familiar with the explanation. To appreciate that this is more than just a parable, we, we need to remember this is actually Jesus' exclusive teaching method at this point in his ministry. If you skip down to chapter 4, verse 33 and 34, Mark explains with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it, and he did not speak to them without a parable. He just goes entirely parabolic in his preaching at this particular point in his ministry. But then he also finishes the verse and says, but Jesus was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. And so this becomes his exclusive teaching mode. This is his pedagogy. He starts speaking in parables. And so I thought about it. I thought, you know, what would that be like if you were in that, back in, in that day and, and, and you, you, know, you were hearing Jesus preach and you didn't hear the explanation. You didn't know the explanation. You know, I imagine just the average a uh, guy at work who happened to be on his way at lunch break and goes by that, that, that section of, of uh, Capernaum and there Jesus is preaching and then he goes home at the end of a long work day and his wife says, honey, how was the day? And he says, oh, I had, had a great lunch break. I, I heard that, you know, that miracle worker, Jesus, he was, he was teaching. Oh, what, did, what, did, what was he talking about? Well, basically he was telling some story and now let's just fast forward to Phoenix today. Well, honey, he was just telling some story about some you know, small business owner um, who, you know, made some contract on one particular day. He went to sleep, and by the time he woke up, this, the cash had gone through. Okay? And you might be vaguely familiar enough with the second parable in verses 26 to 29, and remember there's a vague illusion there, but that's might be what it would sound like without an explanation. You say, what's okay? Is that it? No, he talked about this other guy in downtown Phoenix who bought an empty lot. He paid the same amount for the empty lot as he did for a lot next to it that actually had a house on it because he knew there was gold buried there. Okay, got it. <laughs> what? <laughs> and it's just interesting, if you think about what's happening with teaching in parables, it's, just, it, it, it's not just illustrative. If it was illustrative, the il il illustration became everything. But I'm afraid that even these loose parallels to Christ's original parables might, be, might, might lose us in the sense that you already know some of the explanation of even those, those other two parables. So to ho hopefully a little bit more, give you more appreciation, more full appreciation of parables, I, I, I invented one. So this would be the, an example of parabolic preaching. So let me just rewind, let me come back up, and we, we, we finish worshiping in song, and then I I pray, and then I say, four stones were thrown out. 
One picked up speed before it got wet. Another bounced high and splashed. Another moved unseen. But the fourth floated. <laughs> he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I close in prayer. We sing a final song. We're all dismissed, and we go home warmed and filled, don't we? <laughs> That's parabolic preaching. That's it. That's the sermon. Something's happening here. It's more than meets the eye, because if there was a meaning to that parable, and there is, and so far I'm the only one in the room, room who knows the meaning of that parable, if there was a meaning to that parable, the meaning was obscured. The meaning is not yet clear. And that's the point of a parable. Yeah, and the most famous parable in the Old Testament would be the prophet Nathan preaching you know, a rebuke to King David. And he says the parable is a rich man with many sheep, a poor man with one sheep, and the rich man demands poor man's sheep, to sacrifice to feed his guest for dinner. King David says, that man should die. And all Nathan has to do to trigger the meaning of that parable is to say, you're the man. Why? Because Nathan knew by direct revelation what David had done. David knew experientially, he already knew what he had done. And that triggered the meaning. And it had a profound effect. Well, just to keep you, not to keep you in suspense any longer, here's the meaning of the parable. The parable, this is an average summer day at the Anderson household. Four stones or four boys, and uh, a mom is sending them out because there's way too much energy in the house, and that's how they enter the pool. One runs at the shallow end and splashes water everywhere. Another bounces off the trampoline into the deep end. Another one's swimming underwater unseen. And the, another one's just standing on the flotation devices, not even getting wet. Okay, so that's, isn't that, isn't that so profound? It's so profound. You're so impressed by my ability to preach parabolically now. But I, hopefully it serves the purpose. Something is being revealed and something is being concealed. That's what parabolic preaching is. It conceals and it reveals. To appreciate this, I'm going to go back to pick up the story in Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Mark is a, just a profound a profoundly gifted storyteller. And the way he tells this story is the actions basically just sets the story in verse one. He begins to teach again by the sea and a large crowd gathers. And he doesn't even pick up the story for the reader until he gets to verse 13 when Jesus starts speaking the explanation. What's profound about the way Mark tells basically all of chapter four is that all of the parables are in the background. The parable of the sower from verse, uh, the, the so soils from verse three to nine. Is, is backgrounding the explanation. Everything else that comes after that is backgrounding the explanation. 21 to 25 talks about the value of how we listen to Revelation. 26 to 29 is the parable of uh, the, the, the farmer who went to sleep. 30 to 32 is the parable of the mustard seed. And then he concludes the, the story in verses 33 and 34 explaining this, this was his exclusive teaching methodology. So the story for the reader is the explanation of the parable. It's interesting that we as readers get an explanation that the original audience did not receive. In fact, it's interesting in verse 10, in verse 10, Mark says that as soon as he was alone, his followers along with the 12 began asking him about the parables. So verses 10 all the way through 20, those 11 verses are, are kind of parenthetical chronologically. I mean, that happened later. In fact, if you remember in verse 1, he, he gets into a boat, and so he goes out onto the sea. He gets some distance from this crowd. If you remember from last week, chapter 3, the crowd is so oppressive, they don't even have uh, the freedom to grab a meal. It's just so intense by way of the demand of time, and now it's so crowded by way of space. He has to get distance from the audience by backing up in a boat so he can project his voice uh, to this massive crowd. So he's already in the boat, and then if you go to chapter 4, verse 35, on that day when evening comes, he says to them, let's go to the other side. And it seems as though he just goes right on over to the other side. It seems like 
and this would be a guess, but it's a reasonable guess, that the private explanation did not even happen before they left. The private explanation from verses 10 to 20 probably happened after he calms the sea in that final story in chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. This happens privately. His disciples get the full explanation. And we've got to figure out what's going on here. So part one this morning, we're going to look at uh, really the purpose of parables because Mark gives us, through Jesus' words, the purpose of parables. Why is he doing this? And so go back to verse two. We're going to pick up our story. Um, Mark explains he was teaching many things in parables. And then the first one is this parable of the soils. It's the first of about four of about three examples that Mark gives us. Matthew gives us seven examples in Matthew chapter 17. Um, here's the most famous. Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And Jesus is telling a parable. It's a very common word picture. This is just an every other day event uh, in planting season. Um, Modern day equivalent, you would drill wheat. You would, you know, drill at the right time of uh, of the year for your crops to grow before harvest. And so this is a, a sower who's going to have most likely a bag with all of his grain. And he's going to be throwing seed by hand, spreading it everywhere. I mean, this is a very common word picture. It would be as common in, in Arizona as uh, I had my first opportunity to try to do a winter lawn uh, a couple months ago. And um, I, I probably used more seed than any of you have combined. I mean, it was, it was a mess. But I, I think we actually have a lawn going, but I, I learned, you know, how that, how that process goes. And, and so, you know, casting the seed, I had a little spreader, so I had a little cheater. And, uh, but it would be like telling a parable of something just very common to just everyday experience, and Jesus is just describing this story with no explanation. I mean, they're, they're not missing anything he's saying. The word picture is very vivid. They, don't, they just don't get the meaning. Okay? They're hearing the sower. He goes out to sow. Got it. As he was sowing... And so you're just picturing this guy just casting seed. And that's, you know, that's again, where, where we even get the word broadcast. He's just throwing it far and wide because he wants crops to come up. And so if, you're, if you have a section of your field, there might even be a path through the field or a road at the edge of a field, or there might be spots where there's more weeds or whatever. And so he starts to amplify the reality that would happen if you just broadcast seed all over because you're wanting to maximize your productivity. And so here he says, as he was sowing, some fell beside the road and birds came and ate it up because there it is. It's just totally unprotected. And, and, and lo and behold, in my first attempt at a winter lawn in Phoenix, there were so many birds straight, sent straight from Satan, I'm convinced, to ruin my lawn. And I mean, I even covered it with the topper. And I mean, like they're like digging through that stuff. I mean, like, I don't know. I think it's like a bird magnet. So they're eating up all this seed. Well, if they were in a road and there was nothing covering it, even all the more obvious, it's, it's, it's hard pack. It doesn't even sink in. It's not, it's not covered by anything. It's just right there. It's just like, birds, come eat me. It's very obvious. Other seed, verse 5, is this second category of what, what might happen to this seed. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And... Ironically, uh, in my first attempt this two months ago, the same thing happened. We have some rocks right next to our lawn, and the, the grass in the rocky area actually grew up quicker than where it was buried underneath the topper. And it was just fascinating. Of course, it just you know it was just growing in rocks. It's just like something there. I don't know what it was, but it didn't last long. Immediately, it sprang up because it had no depth of soil, and after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Nobody's missing that word picture. It's clear. After the sun had risen, I'm sorry, verse 7, other seed, the third category here, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And so this is a, a weed, an invasive variety. It's, it's choking out the plant. It prevents it from bearing fruit. It prevents it from full growth. Of course, the lawn analogy wouldn't work here, but imagine something that, some sort of fruit-bearing bush or tree that's just getting choked out by an invasive vine. Verse 8, other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100-fold. And then what he concludes with would have been a typical conclusion, and I want to read it to you in a way that I think is going to be a little bit more literal. He who has ears to hear, he must hear. It's an imperative. 
Whoever has ears to hear must hear. It is obligatory that you hear what I'm saying. And that's the end of the parable. And so when Mark turns a corner here in verse 10 and says, as soon as he was alone... He's still not telling us the story so much as giving us the background we need to make sense of the explanation. And um, Lord willing, next time we get back into Mark, we'll, we'll be able to look at verses 13 to 20. But verses 10 through 12 are absolutely critical for us to understand, to benefit from the explanation of the parable. And so to work through these three verses, I have a, an outline for you. Just It's very simple. The purpose of parables, number one, to reveal mysteries to insiders. Number two, to conceal mysteries from outsiders. The purpose of parables is to reveal and conceal. Parables conceal truth from those who have no ears to hear Christ's words, his message, his truth, while they reveal even more truth, even more insight, they give even more understanding to those who are his family members, to those who have ears to hear. The idea of the uh, insider or outsider is, is common to every class of society, and Jesus uses the terminology here in verse um, 11 and 12, uh, those who are, at least those who are on the, on the outside in verse 11. So notice what happens in verse 10. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the 12, by the way, that was really interesting because already, I mean, you're just two stories after the selection of the 12, and there's already a group of followers who are narrower than the general audience who only heard the parables, but they are obviously larger than just the 12. So there's a group of followers who are already loyal to Christ, and they are listening. They are sitting at his feet, hearing his word. And as he said in chapter 3, verse 34 and 35, these are those who would be his mother and his brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. These are his, his family, not his biological family, his spiritual family. These are his spiritual brethren. These are those who are, are listening. Their hearts have been softened. And when God speaks, when Christ speaks, they listen and then they obey. They do exactly what he says. And so they're with him along with the 12. You've got the followers plus the 12. And they're in private and they're asking him about the parables and they're saying, we got to know. We need more insight. I mean, they're actually obeying the obligation he who has ears to hear must hear. And they're thinking, I want to hear. I want to make sure I'm hearing. And they go back for more clarification. Verse 11, so he answers them. He says to them, to you it has been given. To you it has been given, has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are on the outside, they get everything in parables. There's the you, and there's those who are on the outside. And so this idea of the insider or the outsider is something that we are probably quite familiar with. I mean, from, from cliques in junior high to secret societies among adults, uh, there's just always been this penchant to find a, a group, a, a network, a, 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 a circle of friends or some sort of um, group of relationships where it's close, it's tight, there's something common, there's, there's, there's a benefit to it, there's a sense of familiarity, a sense of belonging or a sense of exclusivity. It might be as simple as we share the same likes and hobbies, it might be as profoundly uh, grotesque as we all are the upper crust and being together makes us feel better than everyone else. But there's just always been this idea of an insider, an outsider, a, a circle, an inner circle, a tighter circle, a group of friends. Consider school. I mean, some of you are in school and some of us it's been many years. But regardless of the era when we were in school, um, there were differences that existed between social cliques. Um, but 
the common denominator of social clips, clicks of any age and any decade is the fact that those clicks are driven by common likes, common hobbies, ways that we all enjoy spending our time together, or that we all laugh at the same jokes and we all have something in common that makes us feel better. In some way, it always exalts the insider. Some circles might simply be formed because a group is, is just like-minded with the other members, and, and some are actually formed because it creates a distinction that benefits us socially. One commentator, James Edward, writes about Jesus' use here of the outsider versus the, the you who, who, get the every, who get more mystery revealed to them, and he says this, he says, the parable of the sower thus reca- recapitulates the insider-outsider motif of chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. The categories of insiders and outsiders were familiar enough to Jesus' hearers who thought it self-evident, listen to this, that observant Jews, scribes, Pharisees, zealots, and perhaps even the Sadducees and the Essenes, that they were insiders, and that lapsed Jews, the Am Haaretz, which just means people of the land, the, the common people, and the Gentiles, they were the outsiders. But this division is of no help in understanding insiders and outsiders in relation to Jesus. In fact, it is often reversed. And that's exactly the case here. I was looking into this idea of even what would have been in the mind of a Jew when it comes to an insider and an outsider. And the, and the rabbis have a, a profound discussion of what the insider is and what the outsider is. And it includes people who add books to the Bible. They're outsiders because they're her- heretics and they add things to the Bible. But it's interesting. I came across a, one passage in Jewish literature uh, that says, if, if someone binds one of the capsules of the phylacteries before the forehead instead of over the forehead or on the area of the hand instead of on the arm... This is the manner of heresy. If someone covers it with gold and binds it on a sleeve, that is the manner of those who are standing outside. It was a fascinating passage because in that passage you can hear that there's a parallelism between a heretic and an outsider. It's somebody who's on the outside. So they've created a category, who's on the inside, who's on the outside. And so for the Jew, it's just, you do your phylacteries the way we do them. And that's pretty much how it went. It was a social distinction. What is Jesus talking about when he says, to you it's been given, but to those who are on the outside? Well, quick review. Let's go back to Mark chapter 3 and look at what we saw last time. Remember Mark chapter 3, verses 22 to 30? The scribes came all the way up to to Capernaum, and they came to just basically tell the, the public that Jesus is satanic. They say that his miracle working is done by the power of Beelzebul, by the power of Satan, and they blaspheme him. Are they on the outside? I would say so. But that doesn't go far enough. As we saw last week, the scribes are just given as a by way of contrast so that we can learn what we need to learn about those who are somewhat more familiar with Christ and somewhat more loyal to Christ. And they feel like, you know what, I'm on Christ's side and I'm actually very partial to Christ and he's actually my friend and I love Christ and I even worship Christ, but sometimes he might just go too far. And the example Mark gives is his biological family. They come from Nazareth and they are concerned, they think he's gone too far, they think he's lost his senses because they hear how popular he's getting so that they couldn't even eat a meal together, verse 30 and 31 say, or 20 and 21. And then in verse 31 to 33, his family, his biological family, is, remains outside. They're standing on the outside, and they call him while he's teaching. In verse 32, this crowd is around him, and they're saying, hey, your, your family's outside. And verse 33, he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he answers it by pointing out to the fact that it's the people who are here with me, not just listening, but actually doing the will of my father. When you get to chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, and we're talking about the purpose of parables, we start to realize that the purpose of parables is 
Uh, it, it's, it's, it's partly instructive because it gives more information for those who are on the inside, and it's also judicial because it's concealing truth from those on the outside. There are outsiders here hearing this parable, and that's all they get. And you think, boy, that, that, is, that is some tough, tough teaching. So how does that work? Who gets on the inside? Who gets on the outside? Well, it comes down to those who do God's will and those who aren't willing to do it. That's how Jesus defined it in verse 34 and 35. In fact, I was even thinking about how tightly knit these two stories really are, and I started to kind of begrudge the chapter 4 heading. (laughs) It's just kind of like, I wish you could just get rid of chapter 4 and just keep going with chapter 3. Uh, don't read chapter 4 as a, an unrelated story. I mean, it is tightly related. He's defined who's on the inside, who's on the outside. And don't forget, he's been preaching and teaching from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and now here we are in chapter 4, and there are people who are still glomming on to Christ, clamoring to have access to his ministry simply because they are self-loving curiosity seekers. They want to be entertained or they want to be healed or they want to see another exorcism. But they are not clinging to his truth. They are not believing his message and they are not practicing God's will for their lives. They don't really have any interest in performing God's will. They don't have any interest in submitting to Christ's authority. They do not want to worship Christ. They just want to be entertained. Those are the loyal fan base who are on the out side. And so when they ask him about the parables, he starts to just level with them. Look, I'll give you exactly, I'll tell you exactly why I speak in parables. Let's pick it up in verse 11. He's saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. The you is the, the 12 plus the followers. These are, this is narrower than the crowds, as I've already mentioned. And it's interesting that he uses the word mystery. To you, the mystery of the kingdom has been given. Uh, The word comes from a Greek word, mysterion. It's just a transliteration. It's exactly where we get our word mystery is the Greek word mysterion. But the challenge with these words are that the, the, the Greek word and the English word don't really have the same connotation. So it's a little bit misleading. Uh, in English, the word mystery can probably kind of, con- you know, almost like a, like a, crime, like a, like a crime mystery. You're almost like it's like a whodunit or you've got to solve some problem. So it seems like sometimes maybe a puzzle to be solved or some sort of problem to be worked through. So it's a mystery. It's a, it's a riddle. You've got to figure it out. And you can only figure it out if you have enough, um, you know, um, wit to figure out this, this puzzle and to solve it. But in Greek, the word mysterion has more of the idea of a secret It's something unknown. It's something previously unrevealed. Information in English, the the word might be used for information that's puzzling. In in Greek, it might be used for information that's privileged. And that might be the way to distinguish these two. This is privileged information. It's information that you, you, you could not know unless it is revealed to you. In fact, in the first and second century, there was a lot of um, secret, it was called Gnostic religions, secret religions. And, and the idea would be some sort of philosophy that's the equivalent of a secret handshake. It's like there's just one little secret handshake, and so one guy starts it in his house and says, hey, here's the secret handshake, and he passes it to the next guy, and only those who are on the inn know the secret handshake. And so everyone wants the, the secret handshake. And, and so that was, that was a, a mystery religion. Here, Jesus is saying, look, there are secrets about the kingdom. Truths about the kingdom not yet revealed. And for you, it's to know. It's given to you. I was kind of intrigued by my study this week as I was reading some commentaries, and one of them said, the mystery of the kingdom is Christ. And I thought, well, that just doesn't add up. That's as old as the Old Testament. That's, been a, that's not a secret. Everybody who can read the Old Testament knows that Christ is the king of the kingdom. We're anticipating his, his arrival. That's not the secret. The secret are these truths that are taught in chapter 4, and namely, especially about the timing of the kingdom and the fact that it's not going to come in full force as it sounds in the prophecies from the Old Testament. But only those who are on the inside, only the you of verse 11, the you plural, the followers and the 12, have been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. So for them, it reveals mysteries. Mysteries are being revealed to the insiders. The insiders. 
But the other aspect of, of uh, parables is to conceal mysteries from the outsider. It reveals mysteries to the insider. It conceals mysteries from the outsider. And so pick it up in verse 11b. Jesus says, but to those who are outside, those who are outside get everything in parables. The outsider. Luke says, to the rest. Matthew, it says, to them. So to you, to them. To you, to the rest. To you, to the outsider. That's the contrast in the three synoptic gospels. And the outsiders, as I mentioned, it's not just scribes and Pharisees who are blaspheming him. The outsiders, even at this point in the story, are actually biological siblings who still are not doing the will of God. The outsiders are those desperate Jews who long to be healed from their physical infirmity and they want to be entertained by a pretty profound show of a miracle worker. The outsiders are those who don't love his teaching, cherish his teaching, long for his word. They're those who don't obey his word. They don't practice his word. In verse 12, Jesus actually quotes an Old Testament passage, namely Isaiah chapter 6, in explaining the significance of preaching in parables to outsiders. And this is so sober. This is so sobering. Verse 12, Jesus says, So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. This is a hard, hard verse. There's nothing really to explain away. It's just something to explain. But Jesus does in fact say that after three chapters of preaching truth, there is a shelf life on benefiting from the word. They've heard, and they've heard, and they've heard, and they've done nothing with it. And so I'm going to parables. Lest they turn and be forgiven? This quote comes from Isaiah chapter 6. I want to turn there. We want to dig in there a little bit and examine what's going on here when Jesus says this. Isaiah chapter 6, it's the scene of uh, the pre incarnate Jesus Christ, where Isaiah sees God's glory. And you remember, this is the scene that took place at the beginning of Isaiah's ministry, and it was the year Uzziah died. So the king of Israel dies, and Isaiah sees a vision of Yahweh sitting on a throne. So even though the human king dies, God is still on the throne, and he's, his train of his robe, verse 1, is filling the temple. So God, Yahweh God, is still the king and priest, even though Uzziah just died. And he sees this vision of his glory. Um, he sees these angelic hosts calling out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, verse 3. Verse 4, the foundations and the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who calls out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, He's in God's presence and he, he's seeing God's glory and he's also then seeing himself rightly and he's instantly ashamed. Then one of the seraphim threw, flew to me with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my lip with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips your, and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. In the presence of a holy God, 
What we need is forgiveness and our sin to be taken away, as Jacob just shared with us from Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the plurality of divine persons from the one Lord comes out in verse 8 in that pronoun, who will go for us. And Isaiah responds to this, and he says, here I am, send me. And so God says to him now in verse 9, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. This is a sober mandate. I mean, Isaiah has just been given a charge to go preach, and the point of his preaching is, make sure you go harden hearts. On first glance, it might sound like that's what he's supposed to do. I and mean, it's like, well, what does that look like? What, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? Aren't I supposed to go and preach your message? Is there no, no more hope? Is there no more forgiveness? Is there no more reconciliation? Is there no more promise of forgiven sins? Well, in verse 10, these three verbs are all causative verbs. And what that means is that God is telling Isaiah, that he's, he actually has a causative role, a cause to play in the insensitivity, the hardness, and the dullness of these people. Verse 10, render the hearts of this people insensitive. In other words, cause hearts to become insensitive. And their ears dull. In other words, cause ears to dull. And their eyes dim. In other words, cause eyes to dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. And again, the, what's, what's parallel here is that these people have been hearing truth and they're rejecting it. God never, God never hardens the innocent. He never has and he never will. There's no, no instance on the face of, in the history of human um, existence that a soul would have an inclination toward hearing truth that God would have hardened. It has never happened and it never will happen. But there is such a thing as people hearing God's truth and not listening and hearing it again and not listening hearing it again and not listening. And God might judicially say enough is enough. But it's really important, I don't want to leave Isaiah until we look at Isaiah for a second because there is something I want you to see about what, what was it necessarily that Isaiah had to do to fulfill this mandate. Look over at Isaiah chapter 28 for a second. Isaiah 28. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Isaiah writes, To whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? For he says, Order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. The little repetition, it's kind of like the, um, it's been called the, the ABCs of grammar. It's like teaching the basics. And so Isaiah is, is teaching line by line, sentence by sentence, word by word, letter by letter, and he's just breaking it down very simply and and as though he was interpreting God's message to babies, as simple as you could possibly make it. Verse 11, indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. He who said to them, here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they would not listen. Verse 13, so the word of the Lord will be to them, order on order, order on order. Line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. 
that they may go and stumble backward and be broken, snared, and taken captive. And so that paragraph gives an example of how Isaiah's preaching and prophetic ministry would have been received by the Jews, almost mocked as though he was so simple, making truth so clear and so evident for everyone to hear that it was just rudimentary, just so basic. He's just preaching ABCs, and they just still would not listen. I find that actually very helpful because when Isaiah is called to make hearts insensitive and to dull ears and to dim eyes, he doesn't have to do anything except just preach the message with clarity and simplicity. And it's going to harden. Now let's go back to Mark chapter 3. And I think you can probably already appreciate what's happening here. Uh, the, the audience that, got, that gets everything in parables and the audience that, gets, uh, that only gets it in parables, that's, that's the exclusive mode of teaching in public according to chapter 4, verse 34. And so in verse 11, when Jesus says to those who are outside, they get everything in parables and that's all they get are the parables. There is a hardening process happening. This is a judicial response on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ to unbelievers. Listen, verses 2 through 12 are all background to the explanation of the parable in verses 13 to 20, and we'll get to that next time. But what I want to spend our concluding minutes on is just thinking very soberly for a second about what we need to gain, what's so critical for us to understand from verses 10 to 12 before we even get to the explanation of the parable we just read. What is so critical? It's, it's simply this. Listen, do not presume that you will have another opportunity to listen to Christ and to obey his Father. Listen for a second. There is nothing more serious and then hearing God's word and not responding. The people of Israel, they've been hearing it for three chapters. Now coming up on four. They didn't listen carefully. They didn't listen soberly. They didn't have a high standard for what it means to truly hear God's word. At this point, there's a little bit of a repetition setting in. There's probably a numbness because of familiarity about that type of message. Oh, here comes another parable. Oh, here's something else. Okay, heard something similar to that before. They became numb to the meaning. They became insensitive to the implications. They were curious. They were entertained. They were fascinated by his miracles. They longed for physical cures. They were desperate to see another exorcism. And the expiration date on listening to the word had come for those who were outside. Listen, Jesus, Jesus, just like his father, would never harden an innocent listener. Never happened and never will. But there is some obscuring going on. And I want to think about that for a little bit. I want to borrow the words from commentator William Lane. He said about this passage, he said, The citation from Isaiah 6, 9 and following it does not mean that those outside are denied the possibility of belief. It indicates that they are excluded from the opportunity of being further instructed in the secret of the kingdom so long as unbelief continues. That the kingdom has come in an initial phase in the presence of Jesus can be discerned only through faith, which is to say, by the grace of God. Jesus' presence, therefore, means disclosure and veiling. It releases both grace and judgment. And that's true. He is still, if he, if he didn't want anybody to know this, he wouldn't even speak parables. He wants somebody to know it, and so he is speaking parables. There is revelation happening, but it's for those who are on the inside. But if he wanted everybody to know it, he wouldn't be speaking in parables. He would just be speaking it publicly. So it is concealing truth for those who are on the outside. 
This discussion is so much more profound and so much bigger than just some mere philosophical discussion about sovereignty. This is a robustly sovereign act of Christ. But it is also, nevertheless, in this context, a reaction and response to the unbelief and the refusal to listen on the part of the audience. How does that work? God is certainly sovereign over all things, but he's sovereign over all things even in different ways to such a degree that you could say, if we looked at it, if we looked at it, if I had time to develop this in the New Testament, you could come to the conclusion that God is absolutely sovereign over the insider and the outsider, but in such a way that every insider knows that they're an insider because of Christ, and every outsider will know on the last day that they were an outsider because of themselves. That's the difference. And so the implication of Jesus preaching in parables here ought to it ought to it ought to sober all of us. And this is this is not a, a sermon to for you for you dear brothers and sisters in Christ and you, you you've seen fruit and you know you you know you love Christ and you're walking with Him. That should not sh- shake up your assurance. It should cause you some sobriety to say, "Wow, so kind the Lord that I'm in Christ and I do not want to neglect God's word ever." I want to listen more carefully. I want to listen more soberly. And if you don't see signs of life, if you don't see death being, sin being put to death in your life, if you don't see a hunger for God's word, if you don't see a brokenness when you're, when you're violating God's word, if you don't see a love for Christians, if you don't see a pattern of obedience, if you don't see increasing growth in Christian character and virtue, then friend, you've got to ask yourself, am I an outsider? Just Hearing more messages? How does this work? I'm going to give you a few passages in the, old, in the, in the New Testament here before we uh, close. Uh, well, maybe I'll have time for one, I guess. Well, one passage here. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 is a, an incredible text that explains the theological reality that it's a really, it's, a, it's an epistolary parallel to what Jesus just did in Mark chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. In 1 Peter 2, let's pick it up in verse 6, verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Peter says this, For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. He explains, Peter explains, this precious value then is for you who believe. So, the choice cornerstone that's going to be the bedrock of all redemptive purposes uh, in Isaiah 28. For those who believe him, he's precious. There's no, there's just infinite value in this individual. We could never be offended by Christ when we believe his message because he's everything. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For the person who doesn't believe the truth, they are offended by the word. He starts with the category of disbelief in 7b, and then when you get to the end of chapter 8, this becomes kind of the tricky passage, or maybe it's, it's sometimes discussed as a tricky passage in some theological context, it, it really isn't all that tricky. It's just, let's just look at it and let's shed some light on it here for a second. 8b explains why that's the case. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this, and the NES has doom in italics there, and to this, they were also appointed. A couple quick observations. They stumble... And uh, the phrase, to the word, is better going to go with the word stumble. They stumble over the word. They stumble over the word. They find offense over the word. They trip over the truth. They stumble over the Bible. They trip on it. Why? Because they are not, and the word disobedient is literally persuaded. 
If you're not believing, if you're not persuaded, if you're not interested in doing God's will, then guess what? Here comes the authoritative declaration of what I must be doing before God, and all it's going to do, if I'm unwilling to do God's will, is that message is going to indict me. And I will reject it every time. You better believe that's going to be an offense. Of course that's going to be an offense. And so they stumble over the word because they're disobedient, because they disobey, because they're unpersuaded, because they don't find it compelling. And if I don't find Christ's truth compelling, if I don't find him compelling, every articulation of scripture is going to be a cause of stumbling. I'm going to trip over it. And then comes the phrase, and to this they were also appointed. The word dooms italicized because it's not there. And it's really one of the more unfortunate additions because it doesn't even need it. The, the phrase is just to this. And the pronoun this is, it's neuter. It doesn't refer to word. Word is masculine. The reason why Peter uses a neuter article, a neuter, technically a neuter, a neuter uh, pronoun here, is because he's just referring to the previous concept. The idea, the concept of stumbling at God's word because I'm not persuaded, that relationship has been predestined. And so you better believe every time I hear another articulation of Scripture where my heart isn't persuaded, I will find cause to be offended and to dismiss that Scripture every time. And so that's kind of a, an epistolary parallel of what Jesus is pointing out here. Let me just ask you something. Let me just ask you about your listening. And you're listening to God's word. We get this background information from Mark about the purpose of par parables before he even explains it to us. And that's a unique privilege. We, we, get, we just got more explanation than the crowd did on that day. We got the inside explanation that was given to the disciples. But I just shared it with all of you because Mark gave it to all of us, and it's public, and it's accessible, and we have that explanation. But if, if someone here were an outsider, you just got inside information. Uh, I just want to, I don't want to, I'm, I'm thrilled, if you're an outsider, I'm thrilled you're here. This is, but I, I just, I'm pleading with you to consider this truth, to consider what just happened with Jesus concealing truth. If you're not interested in living for Christ in the quietness of your own heart, publicly with all of your resources, with all of your relationships, then you, you wouldn't have even had that inside explanation on, on this original day. This is, this is an incredible church, but it's, it's not a good church to to stay in and get comfy and make friends in if you're not interested in doing God's will. It's not a safe place for the outsider. And there's, a, there's always a serious threat when we're exposed to truth if we're not committed to obeying it. Let me just make a quick comment to you students. So thrilled. You students, hear, hear my voice here. All the, all, the, all the kids, all the students who are here. Students, some of you are walking with the Lord, and some of you might not be. And some of you might even think that you're, you know, on good terms with Christ, and, and maybe you're not, or some might actually be worried that you are, and maybe, maybe you are actually walking with Christ. Your, your assurance needs to come from God's Word. Ask yourself, am I killing sin? Am I, am I, do, do I really want to, to know God's Word? Am I growing in, in godliness? Am I becoming more like Christ? Am I, am I obeying? Do I love Christians? You've got to ask yourself that. And if those are manifest in your life, if they're produced by the Holy Spirit, that's intended to assure you that you're on the inside. You may have heard truth from your parents and pastors and friends, but if you don't see those marks then my, my, my fear would be that you'd be on the outside. You might be able to remember specific texts and sermons, and you might even be able to quote passages, 
But if you're not persuaded that you need to obey them, you're going to find them offensive. And you're going to stumble over them. You're going to trip over them. And you're going to find yourself justifying disobedience to them and neglect of them. And you're going to have criticisms of those texts. And you're going to start castigating God and judging him. Listen, whenever we hang on to some self-protecting motive in our heart, it will prevent us from hearing God's word because God's word is relentlessly uh, opposed to, to human glory. Well, there might be a lot of reasons why we might excuse how we listen to God's word, and that goes back to our heart, and we're going to get to that in Mark chapter 4, verse 13 to 20. So next time, we, next week we have membership and baptism, and then we've got um, um, Christmas coming up, but I believe after Christmas we'll be able to get back to the, the parable of the soils, and it's just going to be rich, because what Jesus does by way of that explanation is so, so helpful for our own hearts to make sure that we are listening to God's word the way we ought to. Lord, thank you so much for this text, and thank you so much for your truth. And even, Lord, it's just living and active. And even a, a text that's very familiar to us just is, is still relentless in its punch. And, um, Lord, this, this text is so sober because it's, it's just patently true. And as everything you've ever said, all of your testimonies are upright and permanently established in the heavens. And your words are like silver refined seven times. And so... Here we have pure, clear access to your testimonies. And I pray, Lord, that the, the nature of parables would prepare us, that it would help us, that it would give hope to those who want to know more, and that it would stop uh, those who are indifferent to obedience. It would stop them dead in their tracks. Because, Lord, this is, it's too, this is too valuable. Truth is too important to be taken lightly, casually, superficially, or to be indifferent to. Lord, I am so thankful for your grace and your kindness to us because no doubt all of your children in this church this morning can look at their own hearts and see areas where we have not listened to your word the way we ought to. And to think that here we are, we still get to hear it one more time, we do not want to presume on that. Lord, give us the grace to respond to everything we know from your word we do not want to harden. We do not want to be indifferent. We don't want our sensitivities to diminish. We want them to increase. So Lord, give grace, uh, perhaps even more important than learning something we haven't learned before, is actually just making sure that we are dealing soberly by listening to what we've already known. And then from there, we will learn all that you want to teach us. And so Lord, thank you so much for your grace, so much for your kindness. And thank you for your ministry to us through such a, a heavy, heavy text this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.